What's up, everybody? I'm Mimi. Unfortunately, it's Memorial Day weekend. Simone had to be with her family. So we are here with Saeed, so another S name, yes. Crumpler. And Saeed is a rapper turned screenwriter. So we're going to get into all of that and everything that entails. And we're going to talk about the course he took to get where he is today at Third Wheel Podcast Studio here in Hollywood. What's up, Saeed? How's it, how's it going? How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm a fan of the podcast. Like, I think I, it's funny because we know each other. And, you know, I remember you were like, you should check out my podcast. And like most podcasts are trash, like I said, but I really fuck with yours, though. Well, thank you. Like, well, I'm a garbage can, <laughs> not a garbage cannot. OK, and I may be trash, but, you know, got a little, nah. little, little class, too. But you also have a podcast. I do. And I, I like the name of that podcast. It's for called sure. Two Writers Talking Shit. Yeah. And me and my co-host, Mel, we just started to. And I think... uh like we were talking about before, I think coming from, you know, you coming from comedy, mm -hmm. me coming from screenwriting, like I think it just helps our brand and shows like another side of us. Sure. You know what I mean? To where sure. it's like, you know, yeah, the comedy is one side, mm -hmm. but the podcast, I feel like it's funny because like I feel like I already knew you, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. to me, that's the dope thing about podcasts is like I think it really does connect with the audience. Sure, sure. I mean, yeah. I'm definitely, you know, myself when, I, when I'm talking. Yeah, 100%. And then, you know, I have, you know, as I've you know, explained to you before, like I've got a writing background. You know, I was a, I was a journalist for a long time, TV producer. Mm -hmm. So this is almost like, you know, me having my own little talk show with Simone. And I mean, I love that we get to have, you know, really, you know, interesting guests with cool stories that are mm -hmm. unique. You know, you're obviously going to have an, an awesome perspective on things once we get into it. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's start off. So let's where go. are you from? I'm from Oakland, California, in the Bay Area, which is an hour from Los Angeles in an airplane, <laughs> but about four or six, depending on how fast you drive and traffic and, tra and traffic. Well, what about, what, we, but yo, you walk really fast. So how I long, do. how long do you think if you were walking, how long do you think it would take to get here? Man, about point? four days. You think? Have you tried Two? that? Definitely haven't tried. I don't want to try that. Why not? I don't think you I get have. your shoes dirty. That's I why. Definitely Look don't at these shoes, I definitely everybody. Don't have, listen, I definitely don't have the right shoes. <laughs> and then we'll talk about that later because I've been picketing because uh, mm. of WGA. We're on strike. And I, these are not the shoes I wear on strike. What are your picketing shoes like? The sole is like this big. So are they Doc Martens or what? I don't know what they are. I just got them because I made the mistake of like trying to pick it in uh, Chuck Taylor's. Didn't work. Did you get them at like Walmart because you're not making any money right now? I had to order them. Uh, now that's smart. I might go to Walmart and get some. Like I just need the thickest sole possible because yeah. you're walking in a circle. Do you guys have Walmart in Oakland? Yes, we do. Did we do. It's in San Leandro though. Okay. Yeah. So I'm from Alabama as okay. everybody knows. Yeah. And... Walmart is the hangout in my is hometown. It? Oh yeah. So it, it so for us it the hangout was more like the malls. Mm. Like it was like Hilltop Mall, Eastmont Mall, uh Bayfair mm -hmm. Mall. Like mm -hmm. the malls used to be the hangout spot. So is that like where did you start rapping? Did you start rapping in malls? Now, now I'm like envisioning like an early 2000s teen movie yes, right now. Please. Is that what your life was like when you started your rap career? T-Mobile Sidekick. I had the Sidekick. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was on MySpace. Uh-huh. Uh, we had AOL. That's where you would talk to ladies on a AIM. You would give her your AIM. Right. Instead of like now, you, yeah. you'd be like, what's your Instagram? Back then it was like, <laughs> what's, what's your AIM? Uh-huh. So you'd give her the AIM. But yeah, I uh, I started rapping in uh, junior high school. I would like freestyle. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like just they'd be bang, banging on tables. I didn't mm -hmm. take that shit seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in high school was the first time I recorded a song. Mm -hmm. I think I was like a senior um, and I remember I was in a group, we recorded a song. I was so trash, they took me off the song. So like a week later when that tape circulated, mm -hmm. I wasn't on it. it news to me though. Whoa. And and so, but after that, I vowed to never get taken off anything. And like my career soared past everybody in the group. So it's it's interesting. I think in my career, you mm -hmm. probably will relate to this. I always get defeat the first time. Mm -hmm. And I always go even harder. So, like, mm -hmm. I'm used to rejection. Yeah, for sure. Now, what did you rap about in your early days of rapping? Shit. 
shit I wasn't doing. <laughs> like, so, you know what I'm saying? So guns, it's like, drugs, of course. Drugs, Of course. Money. Did you have any money? Hell no. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, I mean, it's funny because you listen to um, even Biggie, I think, like, it was all a dream. Word Up magazine. Like, it, all rappers in the beginning are trying to manifest success. Mm -hmm. And it's like, on one hand, you could look at it and be like, all right, well, you rapping about shit you don't have. Mm -hmm. But in actuality, you're like thinking about and manifesting it all to happen. Like, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes for the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? And so, yeah, I was rapping about like girls, fucking guns, bullshit, money. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Shit I didn't really know. Did you own a gun? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Fuck no. But I'll tell you this, though, because you're just mimicking what you listen to. Uh -huh. So in the beginning, you're just mimicking everything you're listening to. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like E-40, uh, Spice One, um, shit, Brother Lin Chung, shit like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like those are the people I was listening to, local people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you're listening to like Nas, Jay-Z, Tupac, you know what I mean? Biggie and shit like that. And you're just mimicking. Mm -hmm. Even also like rapping like them. Mm -hmm. You know, and then later you start being like, all right, man, like. I got to start rapping about some shit I'm going through. Mm -hmm. And then I slowly transformed into like myself. Mm -hmm. I remember when, um, so I was like in high school in the, in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. graduated in 03. And that, so that was like, you know, the rise of Eminem when he was like, yeah. so popular. Fire. And there was this guy in my class, in my calculus class, uh -huh. and he would just sit in the back and write raps all the time. Mm -hmm. And he was definitely giving Eminem, he was bleach blonde hair. Mm -hmm. And one day our teacher was like, can you just like stop doing that? Because you're not, you're, you <laughs> you're not Eminem. You, you're not it. Yeah. You're not it. Yeah. But, uh, but did you ever like write in class like when you weren't supposed to instead of like doing your work? But you were actually talented, except for that first song they took you the off. The first of. song I was trash. Yeah. They took me off. Um, but I, yeah, I slowly started getting better and better, like 10,000 hours. And I think embracing like what made you good. Like, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So like. Mm -hmm. Uh, even the way I got the name, my rap name was Balance. And even the way I got the rap name was because I was rapping the way I talked. Mm -hmm. And the other artists in the group kind of rap like Bone Thugs, like fast, like da 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 mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? And I would just rap straight forward. Mm -hmm. And so I started embracing like my voice mm -hmm. as a tool. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, people like my voice. Like I hated my voice mm -hmm. the first time I heard it. Just probably like you hate, may have hated the first time you did stand up or oh, first time God. you hear your voice. Um, yeah. and then I just embraced it and then like started leaning into that. Mm -hmm. So how do you, you know, your, your voice, obviously your audible voice, but your writing voice, how does your writing voice for rap differ or how does your screenwriting voice differ from your rap voice? Not much. Like, you know what I'm saying? Cause I do feel like, and you know, this as a comedian it's like, it is you, but it's like you on 10. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, but you are sharing real life. Mm -hmm. uh, situations like your highs and lows, right? Because in order to relate to somebody, you want to talk about your real life. Like yeah. you always start from a point of what you're going through. And it's mm -hmm. the same thing when it came time to write. It was like the script that got me on was about, um, it was called Flip and it was a 30 minute comedy. It's about a 50 year old pimp who gets released from jail only to find out his daughter is following his footsteps. And the reason why I wrote that is because I met a pimp and he was. How did, wait, uh -huh. did you meet this? Were you a customer? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm from the Bay. We never pay to play. Oh. That's kind of like the Bay way. Okay. So you is feel this, me? Is this like, a rap now nah, you're doing? But my bay is homies, freestyle? No, my Bay okay. homies will feel me though. <laughs> but I, 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 was, I was working at a record store um during the time that I was rapping, it was a, it was a highly successful record store called Rasputin's, which is kind of like Amoeba. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so uh, a pimp came in asking for an application. And I was like, holy shit. He was like in his late 50s. And, you know, it's required by law for you to, you cannot not hand somebody an application. Wait, how, how did you know he was a pimp? Did he have like the pimp walk? He had, or he had a cane. Did he have like the a suit on? Was he driving like you know a 1960s Cadillac with rims on it? Like how did you know he, he was? He didn't a have his girls with him, but he had he had the outfit on and he had came in. Um, and so one thing I did at my job was I was 
what we call, I would take consignment. So if you were an artist, you would bring me your album. I would consign it in store and put it through the stores. He had a pimp DVD that he was distributing. Wait, was it porn? No, 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 no. It was just like him and his pimp tales. It was like, oh. it was like a vlog. It was like before vlogging. Pimp, like, you know what I'm saying? Pimp tales. It was pimp tales. And so <laughs> he brought it into the store and I consigned it. But then he asked me for an application. Uh-huh. And I, I was in the UCLA program at the time uh, that we're going to talk about. Yeah. And uh, extension. Uh-huh. And I was like, man, this is a fucking television show. Like, what if a pimp worked at the record store? Like, you know what I'm saying? And then I started developing that idea. So every time I come with a story, it's based off some truth. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's the best way Mm -hmm. that you can get your stories to connect and resonate with people. It has to be some kind of truth. Like all great comedians come from like, and showing the flaws in the reality of life, period. Oh, yeah. I mean, of course, you know, you can harp on and on about, you know, comedians, you know, making fun of their trauma, which I think, you know, is an overused thing to say. I agree. But it's definitely the truth and what it is. You know, and, and for me and you and, you know, what we discussed, you know, uh, earlier, we're both a little bit older coming yeah. into this L.A. game, right? Yeah. And... But we're coming in, you know, with life experience, with, you know, all of that. Mm-hmm. So that kind of makes us stronger, you know, like like I was saying, you know, when you hear like a 22-year-old comedian, male comedian from, you know, the Midwest at an open mic, just, you know, drawn and on and on just because somebody thinks he's the funniest friend. Right. Like there's no real like substance behind it. You know, like I've been doing comedy a year. But I've been married. I've yes. been divorced. I've moved around. Life experience. You know, that, all of that, you know, heavy stuff that, you know, has certainly benefited you. I mean, you just, what? You started in the UCLA writing program in 2018. Yeah. And now look where you are. I know. In it, five years. Like, yeah. it is literally insane. Yeah, And we're going to talk about that because that's is. wild. Yeah, it is. It, it, it is insane. But at the same time, like you said, like, just like you said, it's a difference. It, the people that are coming right out of college mm-hmm. and trying to break in, they don't have much life experience. Mm-hmm. I graduated from college with a degree in screenwriting and then dove into rap music for 15 years and lived my life mm-hmm. and experienced ups and downs, highs and lows, defeats, wins, death, you know what I'm saying, Relative, whatever. Mm-hmm. And so when it came time to write, and I'm on that trail, you meet a whole lot of people. Exactly. Like just with you, it's like coming to L.A., being from where you're from. Like it's like imagine all the people you met and talked to all in between. And so all these it's different wild. stories and it's characters crazy. that you can draw from at any time. Mm-hmm. And so I think that life experience is what helped me go faster through it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? That they some, some people will say that like if you're older and you decide to take like the jump into the entertainment industry, like if you're if you work hard and if you do have the talent, sometimes you'll ascend faster than somebody that say, you know, moved out here when they were 20. 100%. 100%. And another thing is like this some you'll know too is like coming from working in retail and dealing with people. Mm-hmm. One thing about this game is you have to deal with people. Mm-hmm. And you have to be able to talk to people and all different kinds, all of people. different type of walks, all different type of people. And so I feel like that helps you. It helped me when I got into the game because when I wasn't shy, when I wasn't scared and I was hungry as fuck. Mm-hmm. So it's like I was taking meetings with anybody. I was mm-hmm. entering every fucking contest that was known to men. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, what I'm saying mm-hmm. like the Chitlin, the Oregon burrito film fest, like whatever it was. <laughs> the ch- not the Chitlin. The Chitlin. Is there a, fest. Is there a South? I don't know. So, you know what it, Seuss is, yes, right? That me- yes. Is there a Seuss film fest? It, That's it, for the Southern people. OK. It and, probably is. <laughs> and it for our African-American <laughs> community, they will know what it is. Everybody else, you're going to have to Google it. It's spelled S-O-U-S-E. It, okay? pro- <laughs> it, it, it probably was. And I entered it. And I, I was just for a two year stretch. I had like a shotgun approach where I was like, I'm going to do everything I can. And then all these little things just start working out Mm -hmm, for me. mm -hmm. And you do have to be good, though. Like that is something. So you started. So you did. You graduated in screenwriting. Uh Then you went into rap. Why did you table screenwriting for as long as you did before going into the UCLA extension program? Because nobody was doing it. Like that was the one thing that I I wasn't in the right area you at were the, in the time, bay. I was in the bay. Like none of my friends, like they weren't making movies. Like sure, every now and then, like okay, Ant Man was filmed in the bay, mm-hmm. but they're coming to film with their people and they're mm-hmm. leaving. Like right. they're not. It's not necessarily an industry 
for movie making right. and TV making. Yeah, they may hire like a PA or something like here and there because right. even I, you know, coming from rural, in rural Alabama, I was remember that sh- there was a show. It was my big fat redneck wedding. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. Yeah. So I was a PA on an episode of that show. Okay. The Confederate Memorial Park is outside of my hometown, oh, shit. and these people lived in a trailer right off of like oh, the Memorial shit. Park. That's wild. <laughs> That's and I was a PA on the show. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. But that's tight. I mean, but but that's the thing. It's like, yeah, you could probably do that. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't somewhere where you could go get your movie right, made. Right, exactly. It was too expensive. It's too expensive to play in that lane. And so I just dove head first mm-hmm. into music because that's where the industry was. Like yeah. in the Bay, mm-hmm. it is a humongous independent. Like you could, uh, there's, a, you, there's a joke where it's like you could throw a rock and find an independent CEO record label in the bay like mm-hmm. you could literally throw a rock and hit somebody but it's and it's mostly like rap music and hip-hop exactly right? yeah exactly well while we're just on the, this subject you know we always do a segment called fuck mary kill it's like oh, a little shit. fun thing we do so i'm gonna name three rappers okay west coast east coast in the bay okay and Said is gonna tell us which one he would fuck mary kill this is wild <laughs> <laughs> hey, this listen, is wild. Listen, we're going into Pride Month right now, so we're being oh, yeah. really open minded no, with I, this kind of shit. Okay, I'm definitely open minded. So, all right, would you fuck, marry, or kill? Mm-hmm. I'll go, and I'll go first with mine. E40. Oh shit. Tupac. Oh fuck. Or Biggie. God damn. Okay. Uh, for me. <sighs> yeah, please. I'm just gonna go with aesthetics. Of course, as you should. I'd fuck E-40. Okay. I would kill Biggie. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. And I'm wearing a New York hat, Listen, which is I'm crazy. into body positivity, but wild. that's just a little much for me, okay? He had swag, though. He was in, he was in Versace shit and Kooji sweaters and shit for that's, anybody. Well, good for him. You know, I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm just, he's going to die again. <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right. All right. All right. Is there going to be a hit out on me now? Because I said that. <laughs> I think you'll be all right. Okay. I hope so. But um, I would marry Tupac. Of course. Okay. He's just love for me, you know? Okay. Side note, his documentary that's out right now, Dear Mama, is fire. Yeah, Afini Shakur, she lives in uh, North Carolina. Oh, for real? Mm -hmm. That's crazy. In Lumberton, yeah. She's a really uh, revered and respected woman. It's an amazing uh, documentary. All right. So for me, it's a little different. You're going off uh, (laughs) the way they look. I'm going to go off just, you know, them history-wise, rap-wise. So I'm going to say... Mary E40 because E40 is like that's my that's my homie that's the boss uh and I got to stay loyal to my soil like E40 would say um <laughs> and so that's E40 um damn kill golly man sorry I would say this is this this is not right like, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is just wow. Like, I can't believe this is going to be on video that I'm going to have to say. All right. I would say. Oh, this is what this is. Show no, this, baby. The only. The, all right. This is what I'll say. I'll say. I'll say fuck Biggie. Only because he only had two albums. Mm. OK. Mm-hmm. So E40 has a whole bunch of legendary stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh. Biggie has two fucking classic albums, though. That that Life After Death is one of the greatest albums of all time. But I'm going to say fuck Biggie. Um, oh, my God. I can't believe this is even existing in the documentary of my voice. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, and then I'll say. <sighs> so I have only have one left. It's Kill, right? Yeah. I have to say Kill Tupac. Yeah. Only reason is because Tupac is the most popular, probably rapper of all time. Mm-hmm. And so I don't think he needs any more juice from me. Well, you know what? Tupac is still alive anyway. He is. Tupac is. Come with me. Hail Mary. I'm going to tell you something that's fire. <laughs> so look, I went to a show. It was a Hard Knock Life concert. Mm-hmm. I think Pac had just died. And Jay, it was Jay-Z, DMX, and I think it was like Red Man and Method Man. 
and red man would come out on and do how high and they would be hanging from the ceiling yeah, it was yeah. crazy as fuck dmx would come out no fucking hype man run back and forth with his shirt off and tear the show down oh, and then jay-z came out and he had this melody and i remember he was super smart the lights was out and he played hail mary uh-huh. and it's in oakland it was at the oakland coliseum and i just remember every, it was this feeling i never felt it was like everybody in there and Pac had literally just died everybody in there was singing hail mary word for word in the dark like cell phones up lights mm-hmm. out it was like lighters up it was the mm-hmm. weirdest it, it was like a down there out of body experience Damn. yeah yeah I'm sure like that's was. probably one of my and jay-z was at the point where he was becoming big because hard knock life too was a huge album for him. But yeah, that was probably one of the biggest moments I had live concert wise. I love Jay Z. Yeah, Jay Z's a legend. And we love all those rappers. You know, they're 100%. all ta- that that's why I chose them, you know? Yeah. So, you know, if yeah. I didn't say you, sorry. It's all I'm right. sure everybody cares about my opinion, right? Nah, listen, they do. I know they, they e- E40 though, when I heard Tell Me When to Go oh, that was a shit. seven, I was like I'm on the remix. What? Of Tell Me When to Go. So fun fact. You can go out there, look this up. There's a E40 Tell Me When to Go Bear Your Remix. It's like 12 minutes long though. Oh, I'm going to Cuz he to had that. like 30 rappers on there. Mm-hmm. And um I'm on there. I think I'm like uh, around the 10 minute mark. Mm-hmm. But uh I'll never forget I was on our biggest radio station at the time, KML. I had released the album. It was like 2006. E40 called up and he was like he called in, shouted me out, and he was like, "Bro, I want you on the remix." And so I had eight bars, which is kind of the equivalent of like one minute of rapping mm-hmm. to do it. I did my job on there, though. So can I find this on Spotify? Hell, uh, well, see, it might be, though, but I, YouTube for sure. Oh, we're YouTubing this. Okay. And don't forget to YouTube. We love to see it also. That's where yeah. I'm YouTubing. We love to see it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So let's talk about UCLA Extension. So, yes. you, so you did that. You were living in the Bay. Yes. You were doing the online classes. I've also done an online intro to screenwriting class. Good. Did you do the whole program or did you just, just do a few classes here and there? I just did the screenwriting program. Okay. Um, and uh, it was life changing. So you did the whole, so you got the certificate. You did the yes, whole thing. Yes, I got the got certificate. Okay. I actually came out to LA. I stayed at, at UCLA's hotel that was at the school. It was like, mm-hmm. it was like a big thing for me. Um, and it completely changed my life, that yeah. class. It was a great class for, for me when I did it. Um, I, it was like winter of 2020, so it was right before the pandemic. Yep. And um, a good girlfriend of mine and I did the class together. That's why. And her husband is a film and TV composer and he's very well known. Um, so she just wanted to do like, she's always been in and around the industry and she just kind of wanted just to take it for fun and everything. And she really loved it. It was great. I loved it. But then the pandemic hit and everything went online. And yep. for me, I hate online classes. Okay. So I didn't continue with it, but you did. And look where you are. So you, then after that, you got what into the Nickelodeon writing program. Yep. I, I, I had entered, uh, I had entered every contest. I made it to the finals. Uh, Warner Brothers, they didn't let me in. Two months later, Nickelodeon said, come on. I was like, really? Yep. And so I was in Nickelodeon. Then I got into another fellowship called Mentorship Matters. And then I ended up getting staffed on Showtime show, Flatbush Misdemeanors. Mm-hmm. So I, and I ended up getting an episode. And then that same year, I had rewrote a movie for Jamie Foxx's company called Hip Hop Family Christmas. Mm. that had Redman, MC Light, like Kel- mm. Carrie Hilson, like all, all kind of oh, Neo Hilson. was in it. Neo? Neo I haven't was thought about in him it. in a while. Neo was in Neo. it. Um, Redman was in it. And uh, and then at the end of the year, um, yeah, I, I ended up getting in a CBS program, but I was so far ahead mm-hmm. that I was like, I don't want to take somebody else's spot. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? And then the year after that, I ended up, Signing a deal to Sony TV, which is crazy. So what's what's up with your develop? So it's a development deal. Yep. So can you tell? Yeah. You know, people that may not be familiar with what that is that are listening. It's like signing. It's so funny how music and film are so similar, but it's like signing a deal to a record company. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's like, you know, Biggie was or Pac was on Interscope, so it's kind of like I'm on Sony TV, and so pretty much I am developing television shows for Sony TV 
um, and I work on television shows that Sony TV brings to me or that they already make. Mm. So it's a deal and it's like two years. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I got like a few television shows. One of them uh, with Gabrielle Union mm -hmm. that was just in Deadline a couple weeks mm -hmm. ago, The Yards Between Us, mm -hmm. that's based off of a book. Uh, my boy R.K. Russell about a bisexual football player who comes out. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're doing a television show that's loosely based off his life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's coming. Um, and I got like other projects and stuff. So, yeah, I went straight from that to that, which mm -hmm. is funny because all my reps are like, this happened so fast for you. But I'm like, man, I didn't feel like I lived three lives. Yeah. Like I which I'm sure you could relate to. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah, but this is not about me. It's no, I'm di I <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 definitely. So it does happen, mind. though. Yeah, it, 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 it does happen. And I do think, uh, you know, you just got to stick with it. I, I, mm -hmm. Like I said, even when I got into screenwriting the first year, I failed every contest I entered. Mm -hmm. I entered Nickelodeon three times before I got in. Mm -hmm. But I'm so used to rejection that I didn't give a fuck. Yeah. And coming from music is like you release a song. Motherfuckers be like, nope. And you mm -hmm. got to come with another one, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody really remembers your losses. Mm -hmm. Like nobody really remembers that song that did. They remember the one that rocks. Yeah. But they don't remember the ones. that. Nah, rocked. like they, I don't even listen. You know what I mean? So it's like for me, it was like. Uh, benefit I had was like I was just used to rejection I feel like when you get used to rejection like nothing can stop you as long as you're working hard right right yeah. now how do you feel like you're obviously I mean the, the what's the whole term you know like pulled yourself up from the bootstraps yeah. where you are how do you feel about nepotism in Hollywood or does it yeah. not really affect you because you are so far along and you know you own who you are and you're just like whatever because I mean I'm sure sometimes it's irritating it's irritating for me you know because you see people getting these opportunities yeah. they barely had to do anything they just had the time to go out and network yeah no, and I, money beats money beats talent and hard work if you got money you know what I mean like yeah. that whole thing no I, I, I definitely feel like it's not set up like, look, it's hard because, you know, I had to keep a job the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I, I think like even the class costs money. Yep. You know what I'm saying? It and so does. it's like even getting the program to write scripts costs money. So it's like it's not set up for people who don't have money, you know. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have money either, but I was just willing to sacrifice shit. So it's like if you're not willing to sacrifice, you're not going to make it. And you will see other people that have money having a better time at it, mm -hmm. obviously, because it's like, if you got money, you could enter all the contests, mm -hmm. you could pay to get all the feedback, mm -hmm. you know, you could enter a million fucking classes, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And, you know, let's just keep it real, in Hollywood, people hire their friends. They do. Or who they know, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And so, yes, it is set up for that. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like if you do stay at it and you're willing to sacrifice, then you could do it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I sacrificed. I kept the same shitty car. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't buy the new shoes all the time. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I I, I worked a fucking shitty job for a long time. Why? Because I knew that if I had this shitty job that I could, while I'm at work, I could be jotting down ideas exactly. for scripts and shit. Yeah. And I knew if I was working some tech job, or some job that required me to pay 100% of attention, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to do what I really want to do. Mm -hmm. And so I always looked at my shitty job as like temporary. Yeah, I used to come into work every day with a little piece of paper and I used to fold it and I'd write my goals down every fucking shift. And at the end of the shift, I'd rip that shit up, throw it away, and come back the next day, do the same shit over and over. Were they the same goals each day? Almost, yes, pretty much. You know what I'm saying? And Were they a goal just like a like for your entire like daily goals, well yearly goals? Okay, got like it. I would do by month just to remind myself of why the fuck I'm here. Because sometimes I do feel like you'll be at that shitty job and you'll be like, like I I think my family thought I was depressed for a, a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. Like because they're just like, why are you still working at this shitty job? Mm -hmm. But but you just gotta focus. Like I see it, y'all don't see it. Mm -hmm. And I think coming from music, it helped me because it's like. I created myself out of nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, if I could do it then, I could do this shit again. For sure. And so. To have another resurrection. Exactly. So and so for me, I feel like that's the hardest part. It's like, you ain't going to get no applause. Ain't going to be no trophies. People going to ask like, you're crazy. Why are you moving to LA? 
why are you doing this? Why are you working this job? Like, I think my parents used to give me, shout out my parents, like they're supportive, but at the same time, my mom used to send me these emails like, you know, the airport is hiring. You know what I'm saying? Or like UPS is hiring. And I'm like, I stayed on my target. I was just like, I love you, mom, but like, I ain't working at no fucking airport. I'm not working at UPS because I know I'm not going to be able to do what I need to do, which is come up with these ideas and write when I get home. You got to grind it out. I mean, for, for me, you know, I, you know, I, I bartend. Yeah. I work at a gym. Yep. But I've been able to meet so many amazing people just through bartending. But, you know, you can also see how shitty some people can treat sp- others who are in the service industry because 100%. they don't know like i mean who knows i could be in med school and bartending for 100%. all they know but you know i was i was actually um a couple weeks ago i was on the phone with my best friend mm-hmm. and she says well would you ever think about being an executive assistant again mm-hmm. and i said absolutely not because i'm not going to work for somebody else to support them right while putting all my dreams yep. on the Back, back end and then they'll eventually go down the shitter 100 percent. i'm not going to help somebody get to where they're supposed to be and just forget all about myself 100 percent. and it's hard it's hard to do because uh, and your friends are having success and having families and like moving oh up God. and i like that not not to sound doom and gloom their husbands are cheating on them or yeah. they're cheating on their husbands so who's real who really cares at this point <laughs> It, yeah, exactly. And you just got. If you think s- I'm talking about you, I'm not talking about you. Okay, I'm not. It's another friend. It's not you. Okay, it's all good. Love you guys. <laughs> and uh, that, I, and to keep it real, like I, I think it's good for people to hear because I wish somebody was telling me that because it's like it's okay. Mm-hmm. It's okay if nobody realizes your dream. Mm-hmm. Like uh, Deion Sanders said this shit, where it was like he was like. You know, he didn't have a dad at home when he grew up. Nobody came to his games. So he used to have to get himself motivated. Damn. And it's funny because he was talking about now Dion has like pivoted and transferred from a athlete, Hall of Fame athlete to a coach. And he was like, it's interesting because now he has to coach kids and that need motivation. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you know, his favorite saying is I don't need nobody to motivate me, dog. I I motivate myself. Yeah. But then he had to realize when he's coaching people, like some people need motivation, but I'm really here to speak to people who like are going to, like, I feel like I represent people that want to change their life and do something different. Mm -hmm. And at the same time are, are working that shitty job. And at the same time, nobody's applauding for them or cheering for them. Matter of fact, people are telling you to go do some other shit. Mm -hmm. And so like, to me, I feel like that's part of my mission is just to be like, Y'all, I was doing that same shit, like working a shitty job, barely making it. Like I was on welfare uh, during COVID. Like, you know what I'm saying? So like I was, you know what I mean? So you're on, okay, so you're telling me, okay. Yeah. You. This guy, just for everybody that's listening or watching, this guy was on welfare during COVID, which yes. was, you know, two, three years ago. Yep. Um, doing now a movie. Yeah. Guards Between Us, not a movie, I'm sorry, TV show. Yeah. Gabrielle Union's executive producing it. Yeah. Multi picture, multi show development yeah. deal with Sony. Yeah. And you're represented by CAA. Yes. And I was on welfare getting the EP, EBT <laughs> card. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. It can happen. Yeah. You can do it. <laughs> Let's go. Because uh, that that's wild to me you know so if you think you're like you want to stop what you're doing you have to keep going and you know what you're saying you know like who's going to motivate you well who's going to also validate you like you have to find like your validation from the inside you know and i don't have a problem doing that because i grew up a little bit feral that's tight so i'm good but like there are people though who do need need others like Deion sanders in their lives yep and and like you said like Try to get friends, uh, try to get some kind of social group. Um, like, it's funny because, like, there's a group of friends and we used to meet every month uh, and talk about our goals. And that shit helped keep me going. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? And um, it would be three of us and we meet up for coffee once a month and be like, what's your goals? What's your goals? You might need to be the person to start that fucking group. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? But 
it you really need some accountability mm-hmm. partners. Mm-hmm. It might not be your partner you're with. Mm-hmm. It has to be other people who are goal driven. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? And it, it, it's hard too. I don't know if you you obviously I'm sure you have a lot of you know great friends in the Bay Area. Yeah. One thing that's sometimes is difficult for me is because a lot of you know my closer friends like they're not here and they're yeah. they're in the in, they're not in the industry. Yeah. So some of them don't really get it or get what I'm you know going through you know Mm -hmm. being trying to you know I've only been at you know comedy and entertainment especially this podcast this podcast now a couple of months um before that comedy you know a a year that's wild that's dope like so there's some people that get it and there's some people that don't I mean I've been really lucky like my fa- my family, most of them are motivating with it, but I don't ha- I don't get my motivation from them. Like I don't have to ask anybody for permission. I'm 37 years old today. Like I'm gonna do whatever I want to do. Yeah. Period. And but then my friends, a lot of them are like, well, this is what you should have been doing all along. 100. percent So they're like totally on board with it, but at the same time, it's it's kind of you can't really talk to them about industry stuff because they no. don't know. They're like. They're in no. North Carolina, they're in Alabama, they're in Ohio, you know, do, doing their thing. And, and I don't claim to know anything about like what they're going through, like they're business owners, yep. um, you know, they're, they're, they're parents, yep. they have families, they're married yep. to great people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Key, great, all of them great. All of them, all of them are amazing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, and now, now people are going to be like, they're going to be calling me like, what are you talking about me? Are you talking about me? No, <laughs> no we're not. Just a proverbial uh, thing. Oh, let's see, what else? Gosh, there's so much. Well, so with the yards between us, so how is that? Tell, tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, what's dope is uh, R.K. Russell, he he wrote a book um, that's a super dope book. It's out right now. You can get it on um, Amazon audio book. Mm-hmm. And um, Sony brought it to me. And I was like, okay, this is dope. And it's different. And it's something that people wouldn't expect me to do. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? And that's another thing. Like, even when it came to music, uh, Tupac has this famous line where it's like, I peeped the weakness in the rap game and sold it, which means he looked at it and saw what people weren't doing and like went to that hole. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. for me, it's like, I feel like I always, when I approach television shows and shit, I'm always like, what is it on TV that I want to see? Right. Mm-hmm. And so when I, when I read the book, I was like, this is dope. This is something that's fire. I think I can do it. And so Sony brought it to me and I met with them. I pitched on it like you know my take on the show Mm -hmm. and they're like yeah let's rock so i've been developing that Mm -hmm. before the strike because now Mm -hmm. we're in the strike let's make this clear anybody from the wga that's watching this i am not working on the show currently okay but we (laughs) (laughs) were he's working on this show yeah i'm working on this show not that show right right (laughs) so uh but yeah i was working on the show and you know once this strike is over then we're gonna get the writer's room together mm-hmm. and start working on the show and hopefully it'll be out next year. Mm-hmm. What uh, network will, do you know yet? I can't talk about that okay. yet. Okay. But it will be a network though. Mom's the word. Oh, a yes. net. Oh, a net. Well, no, I'm not saying, it, it'll, it'll be a company. Let's just say that. That's very broad, right? Let's sure. keep it that way. <laughs> it's so broad. So you've got that show. Yep. Do, you, do you have, and you've got two others also, right? Yes. Um, there's an animated show I'm working on. I can't okay. really talk about because okay. you know how this shit is. Uh-huh. Um, and then there's another show I'm working on. I can't really talk about either. So how does anim- how does writing for animation differ, differ from live action? It's definitely different. Um, I like It's funny because when I was in Nickelodeon, I wrote a... It's funny. While I was writing Flatbush Misdemeanors episode, mm-hmm. uh, Nickelodeon emailed me and said, all right, we're ready for you to write this pre-kids show called Blaze and the Monster Machines about this truck, talking truck. And so I literally went from a Showtime show, finished that script and opened up and started writing a pre-kids show. And it really, it's different, but it's not that much different. Like, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? It's still writing dialogue and stuff. And yeah, I mean, in the pre, in the animated, animated stuff, is different because it takes way longer, yeah. right? Because you got to go to an animated studio. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like for instance, I wrote that um, Flatbush episode in November. It aired six months later. Mm-hmm. I wrote the Blaze and the Monster Machines Nickelodeon show in November, and it's not going to air until the end of this year. Mm-hmm. And that's like two years later because it has to go get animated and all. It just takes a longer amount of time mm-hmm. for animation. Yeah. Um, and it is slightly different, 
um, as far as when you think of an animated show, I remember Nickelodeon was like, there has to be a reason it's animated, mm -hmm. right? Because some people be like, oh, I could just make any show animated. No, mm -hmm. like you really have to think about it. Like you have to utilize what animation is. It's a reason, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, maybe the character like automat just flies up to space one second. Like, you know what I'm saying? It'd be harder to do that yeah. in a live show and hella expensive. Mm -hmm. But that's part of the reason, like, you know, or punch through a wall, or whatever. <laughs> I'm just saying you have to utilize what animation is for. Yeah. And, what and so is. thinking like that, that's one thing. That's one thing the Nickelodeon program did for me was like. <clears throat> Help me think outside the box. Yeah. So with the Nickelodeon writing program, because obviously they have live action shows too. Did you? Yeah. Was it sort of like a dual thing where yeah. you worked on both? Yeah. Cool. Like I, I it, in the program, I remember I wrote a uh, a script for Nickelodeon where it was like about this kid in junior high who uh, wants to battle rap, mm -hmm. and he gets beat, and then he finds out his grandfather uh, was a battle rapper at like Ice Cube or whatever. So his dad teaches him. His granddad teaches him how to rap. <laughs> Um, that's so cute yeah it was called tay raps and so uh and even that it was like okay i'm in i'm in a kid's lane uh -huh. which i didn't think i would be doing mm -hmm. so it's like what would that show look like for me yeah and yeah. so that's why i wrote that interesting wow yeah. oh my gosh what a come on what a I don't want to say journey, but your whole, <laughs> it is. No, your it whole is. like excursion from it the Bay to LA has just been outstanding. And Thank I you. can't wait to hear and, and cool. watch more. Thank you. Yeah. It's awesome. Awesome to have you on today. Likewise. Look, I appreciate being on the show. Like I said, I'm a fan. Thank you. Of the show. Thank you. Tell your um, friends. I, I am tell definitely going to tell CAA. <laughs> I, I, I will tell CAA. <laughs> okay. I, I'll, I'll send them the interview. Um, and next time, I'll come back and it'll be like my show is big on whatever yeah. company it's on. Whatever network. Yes. So we can all watch it. So yes. follow you on Instagram yes. at balance510. Like the area code. Yes. For the Bay. Yes. Listen to your podcast, Two Writers Talking Shit Thank on you. everything. Spotify, everything. Yep. YouTube. I, I got to get on your level. Come on. You both. No, y'all. Listen, I got to get on y'all level. Like, y'all got the amazing setup with the video. I'm like, I, I, I'm leaving here. Like, we got to step our shit up. Oh, Mel, you're so you going to get a call soon. Third World Podcast <laughs> Studio. That's yes. where it's at, guys. Yes. And Aaron. Shout out, Aaron. We always Aaron. like to harass Aaron over here in the with camo With the dope today. fucking kicks. He has the... <laughs> Like at that immediate, like, like that's how dude, we, we're like, oh, your kicks is fire. That, that's, that's or mine are okay. I could, you know, I, like I, I could kicks. strike in these for sure. I could, I could walk the rider strike. You could kick some ass. Nice, you, nice. You could be the, you could be the ass kicker for over there. Oh, maybe, maybe I'll join in this week. Please. All right. Well, you know what we do? We flick off the camera, Saeed. Thank you very much. This was We Loves to See It.